Thank you. <laughs> so uh, last week we started with what is the crisis of evangelicalism and uh, identified the crisis coming out of an article say the chapter one of the books that's on the reading list um, by uh, a man named Mark Young who's the president at Denver Theological Seminary and he said that the crisis of evangelicalism is rooted in a crisis of identity we don't know who we are and therefore a crisis in mission. Because we don't know who we are, we don't know what we are supposed to do. And because we don't know who we are and we don't know what we're supposed to do, we have been captured by uh, other ideas or, or uh, challenging ideas and lots of different ideas about what evangelicalism is and what our purpose is. We've been captured by partisan political power, seeking after partisan political power, and we've been captured by, I would say, broadly, Americanism. We also talked about the fact that, as we looked at the history of evangelicalism, one of the challenges that evangelicalism has is that it's not a denominationally specific movement. There's no structure of authority with it. And so when you have this broad denominational adherence, that means there's no kind of clear center. There's no way to define it in any particular way that's meaningful for everybody who would identify themselves as evangelicals. And because of that, evangelicalism can mean many different things to many different people. And one of the things we talked about last week was how many times evangelicalism, evangelicalism is being described. And we in here would say in some form or fashion, well, that's not the kind of evangelical that I am. That's not what I mean by evangelicalism. And the challenge with that is nobody really knows what it means because there isn't this authoritative center. And part of that is just the inheritance of the Protestant Reformation uh, that the Protestant, as we'll talk about a little bit later on, the Protestant Reformation tends towards an individualism and a therefore if we tend toward individualism, then we tend to like to be able to find uh, our faith in the individual way that we like to define our faith. And when everybody's doing that, then it becomes very difficult to have any kind of really meaningful agreement about what the word means. <laughs> and so we would say, well, the word has been hijacked by this group, or the, the word has been hijacked by that group, or by this particular leader, or by this particular pastor, or by this particular whatever, whatever, whatever. And so just the, the, the fact of the challenge of defining it is very difficult for us. We're going to spend some more time tonight thinking through what are the core commitments of evangelicalism and then uh, work through what that might uh, mean for us looking to the future. So I started with a couple of quotes from Mark Laberton, also in this book called Still Evangelical, question mark, uh, from which I, I stole my title. Um, he wrote this, Evangelicalism in America has cracked. Split on the shoals of the 2016 presidential election and its after aftermath, having many wondering whether they want to be in or out of the evangelical tribe. And the questions about evangelicalism have been uh, uh, percolating long before 2016, but the election in 2016 has brought a different level of, of conversation and reflection on what does it mean to be evangelical? And lots of people wondering whether they belong to the tribe or not. Laberton goes on to write, the election made apparent that culture rivals the gospel in defining evangelical, evangelical vision. Our sociological frame speaks louder than our theology. Because we don't really have a core agreed upon theology, our theology doesn't fundamentally define us. So what does then fundamentally define us? Well, what Laberton suggests is that our cultural context has taken that place of defining. So then depending on your view towards the culture and where you are in your thinking about the politics of the culture, then that's going to largely define the way you think of the kind of evangelical you are. But that's connected to a cultural definition more than it is a theological definition. Yes? Doesn't our theological definition define our cultural definition? Ideally, yes. What he's arguing is that that's not the case with 
evangelicalism in its, and that's a, a central part of the current crisis, is that we have defined ourselves or allowed ourselves to be defined from a cultural perspective based on cultural ideological factors rather than having a core theological commitment really be what defines us. <clears throat> so we're confused. That's Laverton's suggestion, and I think uh, as you read about evangelicalism, I think it would be hard to make an argument that we're not confused. I think we have to then think very carefully through where does that confusion come from? Uh, how do we find our way out of that confusion? Or maybe we think, you know, as we often do, we're the ones who aren't confused and everyone else is confused. Right. Right? That, that tends to be the way that we can, that we approach these things as well. Um, but, I, I, you know, in the, just in the broader conversations, uh, there are, there's so much being written right now within the evangelical world about the evangelical world that I think really does make it very clear to see that there is a great deal of confusion. So his suggestion is that confusion is coming from this um, allowing the, the, the culture to be what defines our evangelical vision, our sociological frame speaking louder than our theology. And I think that's connected into the identity issue. And what is the identity of the evangelical church? What is the identity of the evangelical movement? And that's what we're going to be reflecting on together over these few weeks. So, I think the need is to reflect on evangelical theology. What is evangelical theology? And then from that to reflect on our relation to the culture. I put this up last week, kind of the plan. Uh, we did a brief history of evangelicalism last week. Tonight we're looking at theological commitments. And then uh, next week and the week after, we'll do the identity and the mission, and then we'll tackle a few different issues of how evangelicalism is interacting with the culture around some of the, the hot button, the, the challenging issues of our day, politics, race, and sexuality. And then we will end with thinking about the global future of evangelicalism, and particularly around as the United States lessens in its importance as a uh, ecclesial theological leader, and as the centers of gravity of the church are moving away from the United States to other places, particularly Latin America and Africa, the global south, what does that mean for, for United States evangelicalism and our position in the world? Uh, as we will need to move from being those who feel like we're in charge of Christianity to a, I think, much healthier place of being humble and uh, open to what God is doing in other places in the world and how that can come back and impact the way we think about our own faith. All right, so again, just my goals for the class. Um, uh, as I said last week, I didn't put it back up here, but just a reminder, my goal is not to debate the Trump presidency, the Trump administration. Um, at least that's, you know, that I said last week that can come up, but that's not my, my main thing. My, my main thing is to reflect on the factors that brought us to this crisis, which didn't start in 2016, but has certainly been brought more into focus. To reflect on the root of the evangelical crisis, which I'll talk about here in just a second, and then, Lord willing, to build a constructive vision for a way forward for the church. Uh, I think we get um, more traction out of being constructive. I think it's also a lot harder to be constructive. It's, it's a lot easier to tear down than to build up. And I think a lot of the work of understanding what needs to be torn down actually comes from being constructive and from that position seeing what's not working. And so my goal is not to do a, a whole lot of tearing down. My goal is to try to be as constructive as possible uh, in order to identify what does need to be torn down. My thesis for this whole uh, eight-week class is that we are suffering from a poor ecclesiology, a poor theology of the church. And we're going to be moving in that direction tonight. Uh, and then that's really going to be next week and the week after, identity, 
and mission. What we're going to be doing the next couple weeks is really thinking about an ecclesiology, a vision of the church. What is the church? What is God's mission for the church? What is God's purpose with the church? So tonight we're going to do these theological commitments and then from that set up the, the ecclesiological conversations that we're going to have the next couple of weeks. But to do that, we still have to gain some clarity on what is evangelicalism. Last week, uh, we went through a brief, though you may have experienced it as not so brief, history of evangelicalism. We went back to Luther, we went from Luther to Trump. And I'm working through the history, that's quite a thing, isn't it? I'm working through the history of, I know, that'll make your head spin. Uh, through the history of evangelicalism, we looked at early evangelicalism rooted in England, rooted in the Methodists, the Anglican Church breakaway from the established church in England, how that came over through evangelists, uh, Jonathan Edwards, the First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, into the modernist versus uh, fundamentalist conversation uh, debate, and then how that really defined evangelicalism into the 20th century. And we finished up with Billy Graham and uh, George Bush, and then on into on into Trump. So that's uh, that's the not so straight line of evangelicalism. Tonight, we're looking at the theological commitments of evangelicalism. And so then we'll be ending our time tonight really setting up some questions. What is the, the evangelical church? Do we have an evangelical church? We have an evangelical movement, but do we really have a church? Now, we all, of course, would say, well, we're sitting in a church building. We are the church. But as I will point out and, and suggest, um, I think we need to do a lot more thinking about what the church is and is meant to be um, as we think through the crisis of evangelicalism. It, it is my view that the way out of this crisis is through a more robust ecclesiology. I'm not suggesting that, that seven weeks from now we will have solved everything that is troubling evangelicalism, but I'd like to think we have some ideas about where we need to go, and particularly then what that means for this particular local body. Because I, you know, it was asked, the question was asked last week about um, kind of what the seminary's role is in all of this, and I, I think seminaries do have a role, but I actually think that the renewal of the evangelical church is going to come from congregations like ours doing the work of figuring out what this looks like um, in our own locatedness, in our own social place, to figure out what it means for us to be the church. And as local congregations start to do this, certainly interaction with seminaries and with theological thinkers that are outside of the locatedness of the church. But this is a church issue. And I think church issues get solved by churches. The academy has a certain role, and it's an important role, but I don't think we should look to the academy to solve this issue. I think we, Central, and lots of other churches doing this work are the way that we move towards getting out of the crisis that we're in to something, Lord willing, that is a renewal movement in the church and in the United States and in our own particular locatedness. So I think we should be a bit grandiose in the way that we think about us, the way that we think about ourselves, the way that we think about what we're doing here. What we're doing here is we are working on trying to solve this problem, not waiting for other people to do it. So that's that's in my mind, that's in my heart as we think about this. So you're it's being deep. pretty contrary. What's that? You're being kind of a contrary in that. I mean, is it in what all, way? Well, I mean, aren't all other, say, field of education, everything kind of descends from the academy down? <laughs> yeah. So yes. So you're. I um. So when you say so, a whole other course that that we could do at some point in time would be around um, the relationship of the church and the academy and how these things interact. And I have lots of thoughts on that myself, as being located in both and and being involved with both. But and I, I value the academy. I think the academy is important. But uh, I actually think that theological leadership for the church for the church needs to come from the church. Um, the academy has a place to play, but a reason I think we have some challenges in the church 
is because we have farmed out theology to the academy, and and that's left us with some some significant problems. So, yeah. All right. <laughs> so this week, the commitments of evangelicalism. And I'm going to frame this through what is called the Bebbington Quadrilateral, um, which uh, I'll, I'll explain here in just a second. Clarence was bringing this up last week, and then I, I kind of cut him off because I didn't want him to give all the answers last week. Um, but you were talking about the National Association of Evangelicals defines evangelicalism through these four uh, things that are contained in the Bebbington Quadrilateral. So that's what we're going to be working through the first uh, chunk of tonight, a good chunk of tonight. Just to, what this na quadrilateral, it just means four. I mean, this is kind of, you know, the grandiose stuff that you have to write in order to get published. You have to say big words that you could say in a lot shorter words. Uh, it's based on the work of a man named David Bebbington. So that's where Bebbington comes from. He's a historian at the University of Stirling in Scotland. Uh, he wrote a book, it's a very well-known book, called, uh, called Evangelicals in Modern Britain, a history from the 1730s to 1980s. And in that book, he, he defines evangelicalism, uh, of these, four, these four theological commitments. I will also add, he was trained at Jesus College in Cambridge, which is where all the great theologians <laughs> have, been, have been trained. <laughs> They, they all, a lot of them ride bicycles too. We, we, yes, yeah, yeah. we ride bicycles there. So <laughs> Based that, on that. That's my old college <laughs> in Cambridge. So. Great memories there. So, Anyway, all right, four defining commitments of evangelicalism. The first is crucicentrism, <laughs> which again is one of those things that you have to say in order to get published. But what this means is the cross is important, all right? The, that's what we could do, but then you don't get published by Oxford University Press if you if you write the cross is important. Right? Anyone can say that. You have to write crucicentrism. So crucicentrism is the cross centered. The cross is vitally important to the evangelical faith. And when we say the cross, what comes with that is a pretty wide variety of different theological commitments. And I want to walk through some of those, that it encompasses this, um, this broad range of theological issues inherent in the, in the tradition. I think one of the fundamental things that's uh, important to note about, about the evangelical movement is soteriology, salvation, the doctrine of salvation, is at the heart of evangelicalism. That's at the heart of the, of the tradition is a, uh, a, a theology of salvation. A need for salvation due to our rebellion against God and our sinful condition. So we as human beings are those who through the fall that is uh, in Genesis chapter 3 through our own actions are those who are in a sinful condition of rebellion against God. With that comes a human inability to secure our deliverance from that condition. We can't deliver ourselves from the sinful condition in which we find ourselves. But God can. And God has delivered us he has given to us salvation by his grace. And this goes back to the Reformation. This goes back to Luther. Justification by grace through faith. God justifies us. God makes us just. Makes us right. God delivers us from our sinful condition. We don't do that. He does that on our behalf. So justification by grace through faith the Reformation roots of the tradition. And God has done this through the atoning work of Jesus Christ that is centered on the cross. Christ's death is a work of sacrifice through which Christ bore sin, the sin of all of humanity through all of history. 
Christ bore that in his own flesh, and that was put to death at the cross. So the crucifixion of Christ, crucicentrism, is at the heart of the divine purpose of salvation, the divine work of salvation. Jesus <clears throat> came to do on our behalf what we could not do. Jesus lived in perfect fellowship with God, which is what the first Adam was created to do. The first Adam chose not to live in perfect fellowship with God, but instead rebelled against God. And so the second Adam came. Jesus is described in the New Testament as the second Adam, or the last Adam. The second Adam came and did what the first Adam was created to do, but was unable to accomplish through the choice that he made to rebel against God. And so Jesus' life is seen as he is our vicarious representative. He stands in our place. He represents us to God. He represents us as sinners. He takes on the sin of the world and is crucified in the place where I should have been crucified. I should have paid the penalty for my rebellion. I don't have to because Jesus has done that as our representative. So he takes on the old, the fallenness of humanity. And through his crucifixion, the old is put to death. So Jesus' death on the cross is the death of the old Adam the death of the old humanity in sin. And therefore, Jesus' resurrection is the creation of the new Adam, the new humanity. And so when we think about cross-centered, it's not just the event of the cross. It's all of what God has done in his mission through his son, Jesus Christ. All that he has done that is centered in the cross, that includes Jesus' incarnation, his life of obedience, his death on the cross, and his resurrection, that all of that is the work of God on our behalf. And therefore, Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection are applied to us, and we are declared righteous in God's sight. So what is true about Jesus is true about you right now. What's true about Jesus is that he is resurrected as the new humanity. Therefore, through faith in Christ, that is true about us. It's not true about me in terms of I am fully perfect, because I ain't, but Jesus is. And what's true about Jesus is true about me. And one day, the deliverance of the gospel, the, the deliverance of the full promise of the gospel will be the case for all of us who are in Christ. And we will be perfect as Christ is perfect. That will happen at the resurrection of the dead. We're not perfect in ourselves, but we are counted as perfect in Christ. Because when God looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness, not our unrighteousness. So God deals with us as if we were Christ. So our position is secure. With this then comes the belief in a literal bodily resurrection of Christ in history. Jesus really rose from the dead. That is a, a historical event. Not just a symbol as it, as it becomes in, in other traditions, but a, a literal bodily resurrection as well as then the expectation of a little, literal bodily return of Christ to establish his kingdom at the end of this present age. The fullness of the kingdom of God will break into history and God will restore all things and renew all things. And all will be made right. All will be just. All will be justified. So, crucicentrism the foundational importance 
of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and all that that means for salvation and what God is at work to do in the world. Okay? So that's point one on the Bebbington quadrilateral. Questions, comments? Yes, Adam. <clears throat> Uh, other Christians, or Christian Christians outside of Philadelphia, or who are so unconcerned with the cross that we claim this as a defining characteristic, or just much less so. I would say so. Should be just about any so one of the things that we're we're going to talk about a little bit later on is um, you know, the the difference differences between liberalism and evangelicalism, and and one of the things as we looked at last week. Evangelicalism existed before liberalism, but in the last 120 years, evangelicalism has really defined itself in relation to liberalism. And in liberalism, the, the, the cross is viewed very differently than what it is viewed as in evangelicalism. You don't have a literal resurrection in, in liberal theologies. You have things that are, are much more symbolic um, and with that then comes a change in our understanding about what sin is. And so uh, these things kind of hover around together. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later on. But um, so I, I would say we, we certainly, uh, we would share the importance of the cross with lots of other Christian traditions outside of Protestantism. Um, certainly the cross is very important in Catholic theology. Certainly the cross is very important in Eastern Orthodox theology. Our understandings of soteriology, salvation, are different, and how that's applied to us, and what justification means, and where it is in the process. That's that's all quite different. But the centrality of the cross is uh, it's not it's not our the only thing we you know we we have it and no one else does. But certainly in the evangelical modernist evangelical liberal conversation, that's very important as a defining factor. Doug. Okay. I'm looking at those um, points, uh, and oddly <coughs> to me, it, it's easy to imagine the literal bodily resurrection of Christ. It, it happened in history. Yeah. I believe that with all my heart. Yeah. The one below it, I'm having trouble with. If it's the literal bodily return, which I, I kind of believe that, but I'm trying to having a hard time with the mechanics. If it is that, he can only be in one place at one time. He will look like somebody. What will he look like? He will be male. Uh, will, will he go to Jerusalem? Will it be televised? Will journalists cover this event? How will we know? I mean, if it happened 200 years ago, you'd have to have a packet, a clipper <laughs> ship, you right. know, with yeah. somebody, an eyewitness who'd been there. Right. I'm just kind of hard to get imagining that. Yeah, it's yeah. hard for me to, to believe how that would happen. And even yeah. if it is televised, do you believe it or could it be a hoax? It's weird. It's weird. It's, weird. it's, it's weird. a great question. Um, I, I, I don't know all the. I, I do know that, you know, I, I think one of the things that the Bible tells us is that once Jesus was incarnate, he remains incarnate for all of eternity. He becomes a human. Well, then that contradicts that. And he, no, because he will return as a human. He will return as a human. That's the bodily return, oh, incarnate, yeah. right? Incarnate. He, he, he took up. Yeah, I, I was thinking that meant spe a, a spirit. No, no. So he was incarnate as a human. So he he became a human being, and for all of eternity, he will be a human being, um, and he will be a Jewish man, as uh, as the representative of of humanity. He will be in that form. He he is in that form even now. As he sits at the right hand of the Father, he is a human. I assume Christians, even though we've never met Jesus in person, we have this feeling that we will recognize. Mm -hmm. Yep. How, what are the how are the mechanics? Of that? I, I don't know. This the is mechanics. Off yeah. Just, I don't know the mechanics, but I do think the importance is the that, and I think this is something a lot of, of Christians don't think through, is the eternal incarnation. That once he once. God joined God's self to humanity, that joining remains for, for all of eternity. Jesus will be a human being with us 
for all of eternity. I don't know locatedness and how all that works. And, yeah, you stigmata know, in the hands, but nobody ever talks, well, he had welts on his back, scar tissue. Yeah, I, he, he, had, he had the scars when he was resurrected. Right? Um, so I think there remains, so if I can go on a theological flight of fancy here for a second, I think the one imperfection in eternity will be Jesus' body. And what I mean by that is the scars on his hands will remain for all of eternity as a reminder to us of what God did to secure for us eternal life with him. Now, I couldn't take a chapter and verse on that, except that after he was resurrected and he appeared to the disciples, they recognized him. He was seen. He could also go through walls and just appear. So there's something funky going on there. But he ate, right? He sat by the lake, and he was cooking up the fish for breakfast when when the disciples came and recognized him in John's Mundane gospel. Mundane human thing he ate, to do. He, he, they could touch him. That's how Thomas stopped being doubting Thomas. Thomas gets a bad rap, right? He, he doubted for a couple days, but then after that, he, he, he got on side. But he believed because he saw the scars. So I, I do think that that will be the one blemish in eternity will be Jesus' body. will have the reminder to us of what it cost God and his love for us to secure our life with him. Let me ask, let me provide some understanding, me, <laughs> to what you just said. I'm going to tell you about my mother, who was a very difficult person. And I still remember at Christmas, when I was a youth, she's, she's gone now, but when I was a youth, I already know that she would go down to the local bar. I, I lived in a small town. Go down to the local bar. She planned, it was two days event for Christmas. Go down to the bar, and everybody that was kind of that transient, that yeah. You're, you're, you're available, you come over for dinner on Christmas Eve, you, this is a must, from five to six. Neighbors were six to eight, and family was eight to 11. So given that said, I married my, and by the way, she wasn't exactly a church goer. Okay. Um, so then I married into ELCA, my wife, Strong, Strong church doors. Mm -hmm. There's no way, <coughs> no way, if even an in law would be invited for Christmas, other than the guy at the bar. Mm -hmm. So I just so if Jesus were to come tomorrow, I really wonder how many of us would recognize him. It just, it just, it just an observation. Yeah. Yeah, and I, um, you know, we have things like the trumpet sound and, and those kinds of things. I, I don't know what the return of Christ is going to look like. Will it be subtle? Will it be not terribly subtle? I think the, the biblical promise is, though, that he will bring in the fullness of his kingdom, and this world will be renewed, um, and those who belong to Christ will then indwell in that renewed world for all of eternity. Okay, let's uh, let's move move forward here. Um, the next one in the quadrilateral is biblicism, the importance of the scriptures. That for evangelicalism, we have a high regard for scripture as the ultimate authority. That God's character, we believe God's character and God's purpose are revealed in the Bible. And in believing that God's character and purpose are revealed in the Bible, we refer to the Bible as the final authority or the canon. A canon means a measuring stick. Uh, this is a, a Greek uh, term that, that was kind of how, how you measured something, was the, the stick was the canon. And so what this means by saying that the Bible is the canon is that any claims about who God is have to measure up to what the scriptures say. So, if somebody came into this room 
and said, I have a revelation from God. God has revealed to me that God is a big purple dinosaur. We would want to open up our Bible. We would say, thank you for that. We appreciate that. Now let's open up our Bible and let's read about what the Bible declares God to be. And we could probably come pretty quickly to, to the realization, to the agreement that that doesn't really line up to the canon. That, that, that doesn't, I know you claim that God told you this and that you got this revelation from God, but we're kind of thinking maybe that there was something else going on there in your life because this is what the scriptures say about God. And that's easy when it's a purple dinosaur. It's a lot harder when it gets to other theological issues which we're going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, but that is what we mean by the canon. It is the authoritative statement about who God is, what God is doing in the world, what God's character is. With this comes a couple of different uh, ways of thinking about the reliability of the scriptures. The first is inerrancy, that the scriptures are perfect and without error in their original autographs. That means the original writings. We have copies in, in, in the Bibles that you and I carry around, um, we don't have the original of any of the biblical documents. We don't have the original of Genesis. We don't have the original of Revelation. We don't have the original of any of Paul's letters. We don't have that. What we have are, are copies, and we have copy traditions where you can see the copies as they were being made. You can kind of do uh, looking back over the textual traditions, and you can see... Um, where certain errors were made in a copy. And so the confidence that we have is that the text that we have is uh, very reliable and uh, reflects very well the original autographs. And there's people who do this kind of work for a living around tracking these different manuscripts. And uh, that's not my thing, but that's what people do. But when we talk about inerrancy, we're not saying that every copy of every book of the Bible that's ever been written has been perfect, because it hasn't been. We are saying as you track back to the original autographs, inerrancy would say that those are were perfectly written down and true in everything that they claim. You also have uh, inspiration that say that the scripture are, are the word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and true in all matters of faith and doctrine. Depending on who you're talking to, there's some difference between these. There are people who would hold to a doctrine of inspiration who wouldn't necessarily hold to a doctrine of inerrancy. Then a doctrine of inspiration says the Bible claims certain things about God, but in all of its claims, like how many people died at which battle, or how many, uh, you know, this, that, or the other, in other areas, it's not necessarily making literal claims, or there can be some errors within the Bible around those things. But everything that it says about who God is and what we're to believe about God is, is trustworthy and is true because it's a product of the Holy Spirit. The scriptures are God-breathed, we're told in uh, 1 Timothy. That the scriptures are, are breathed by God. Now, this raises a question, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but it does raise one of the challenges that we have in the evangelical Protestant world. Well, whose interpretation of the Bible? Because this is uh, one of the challenges that we have of not having an authoritative interpreter of Scripture. So, whose interpretation? Let me just illustrate this briefly by the family tree of Christianity. Okay? So here's the family tree of Christianity, rooted in Judaism, uh, and Jesus. And then for about a thousand years, you had the one holy Catholic apostolic church. You had a branch, a couple little branches that came off the Armenian church and the Coptic church, that's the church in, in Egypt, um, that, that came off around the fifth century here where there was a, a break in the church. Then 1054, you have the great schism of Eastern Orthodoxy. That's where the West and the East split. So you have Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, that goes into Greek Orthodoxy and Russian Orthodoxy and then smaller twigs coming off of those. But still up until 1500, the family tree didn't have a whole lot of branches. And then at 1517, what happens in 1517? Luther. Right? And then what does Luther do? 
Luther says, the way I read the Bible and the way the church reads the Bible, they don't read the same. And what the church teaches as the, the, what the scriptures say and what the tradition says, what the church says and what the Bible says aren't the same thing. And so Luther says, sola scriptura, right? Only the scriptures. And the Roman Catholic Church is very nervous about this. Because the Roman Catholic Church thinks, well, if you, a little lowly monk, can have your own interpretation of the scripture, then what do you think is going to happen? Well, everybody's going to have their own interpretation of the scripture. And what happens after the uh, Reformation? Everybody has. Everybody has their own interpretation of the scripture. That's what denominations are. Denominations are different groups that believe different things about how to interpret the scripture. Right? And so you have the radical reformers with the brethren, the Mennonites, and the Hutterites. You have the Lutherans just branching off from the Pietists, the Moravians, the Covenants, the Priests. There we are. We're out here. This wasn't updated by, to say converge, but there's the Baptist General Conference. You have the reform tradition. And of course, this doesn't even get the picture, right? Because there are lots of different subgroups of all of these. I mean, if you really wanted to hone in on it, you got all kinds of different twigs branching off and branching off and branching off. And this is exactly what the Roman Catholic Church said was going to happen. This is why the Roman Catholic Church didn't want the Bible to be translated into the local vernacular. The Roman Catholic Church wanted it to stay in Latin and to have the learned people be the ones who interpret it and to have a Catholic um, structure in which the interpretations of Scripture are declared by the hierarchy of the church. The, the drive behind that was unity. The, the unity of the church and the Roman Catholic Church was deeply concerned about what happens when everybody gets the Bible in their own language when everybody gets the Bible in their own language and everybody becomes an authoritative interpreter and what happens then is the explosion of denominations so this is a problem that we have and it's one that I don't know how to solve and it's one that I don't think we're going to solve it's one that I think is just an important thing for us to realize I'm not Roman Catholic I, I'm not interested in becoming Roman Catholic um, and this doesn't quite tell the story either because there are twigs and branches within Roman Catholicism it's not to say that every Roman Catholic believes all the same but there is a structure for interpretation and defining what is the faith that the Protestant tradition doesn't have and so the family tree goes crazy around 1550 and continues to uh, uh, splinter off and branch off and, and local churches branch off because we interpret this verse different than you interpret this verse and so we're going to go found our own church based on our interpretation of the scripture that's a problem again I don't have the answer for it I think it's just part of what it means to be Protestants but I think it's important for us to recognize that our biblicism I think that the scripture is the authoritative canon. I think it's vitally important that we agree to that. But that doesn't then solve the question of, well, whose interpretation of the scripture? And that's why part of the reason why the church is so important is because I believe scripture is best interpreted in communities, not by individuals. So that's a whole other class, though. That's a whole other thing we could get into sometime. All right, any, any, how are we doing? Questions, comments? Doing all right? Okay, conversionism. Conversionism is the third tier on the uh, Bevanian quadrilateral. Through faith in Christ, people are born again, right? Born again. That's a very important concept of the evangelical tradition, that something changes in our hearts when we come to faith in Christ, that we are given the Holy Spirit. We are born by the Spirit. Uh, we are... This is rooted, of course, in John chapter 3 when Nicodemus comes to Jesus and Jesus says, you have to be born again. And he says, well, what does that mean? I can't climb back into my mom's womb. And she's like, you clearly aren't following what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about a physical rebirth. I'm talking about a spiritual rebirth. And so born again is one of those phrases that probably we've heard all our life. Those of us who grew up in evangelicalism wanted to make sure that we had been born again. Uh, and outside of the evangelical church, one of the ways that, that people describe us as the born-agains. They're the people who talk about born-again all the time. 
Um, a personal relationship with Christ. Then is that very much a, a, an important part of this? And a deepening relationship with Christ through prayer and studying the scriptures and the, the disciplines of, of uh, the, the spiritual life. A piety, a, a warm-hearted commitment to Christ is central to Christianity in a conversionist way of thinking. And then, of course, evangelism. We are converted, and then we are called to share with others what we have found through our conversion to Christ and encourage them to be converted to Christ. So conversionism, evangelism is very much um, a hold together. Another way of putting this, faith is not formulaic. In evangelicalism, this is very important. Our faith isn't just about kind of doing formulas and going through the motions of going to church and doing ritual and doing these kinds of things. It's not about a, a rote religious practice. It's about a personal faith, personal walk, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, there comes with this a rejection of liturgical or ritualistic approaches to Christianity. And one of the implications of this that I think is important for us to note is that this brings with it, within the evangelical tradition, a strong individualism. This has been a part of the evangelical tradition, continues to be a part, and I think is one of the challenges that we have. And one of the things we really need to think through and address. Because this emphasis on conversionism tends to lead to an individualism. And, and we'll talk more about that in just, a, in just a couple minutes. The last one on the quadrilateral is activism. The gospel will have effects in the world. The gospel will have effects. You see this in the tradition of missions. Right? As we get the, we've got the great commission from Jesus, go and make disciples. Um, that one of the effects in the world will be the making of disciples. That we go and we send missionaries to go uh, and do overseas work and to uh, convert people who don't know Jesus, people who haven't heard the gospel, to convert them to Jesus. That's one of the, the, effect, the effects of activism in the world. And the second is social action, which has been seen throughout the evangelical tradition. Um, social action of serving the poor social action of, of founding schools and the importance of, of education, um, social action of hospitals, of we can take, for example, fighting slavery. Um, particularly, we see this in the English evangelical tradition with William Wilberforce. And certainly those who would call themselves evangelicals were on the forefront of the abolitionist movement in the United States as well. And we can give lots of other different examples of this, but social action has always been part of the evangelical uh, tradition. Was the mission emphasis on the, the prior slide, did that occur simultaneously in Europe and America and other countries? Or was England the, the place where it, it really originated? Kind of rooted, yeah, it was rooted in England. Um, uh, but, not, you know, that's a good, do, do you know that? You may know that better than I do, Clarence. The, the kind of missions movement, when that really exploded, did that happen first in England and then the United States? Or was it, were they both I about the same time? Simultaneous. About pretty simultaneous? Yeah. 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 But in the 18th century, you started to see this. Uh, 18th into the 19th century. And a lot of that has to do with technology, too. Right? Missions and technology are always been an interesting thing of how as technology changes, then, then missions changes. But when you started to be able to travel around the world a little bit more quickly, and people could go out uh, and uh, uh, take the gospel with them to these places. So, yeah, the people who would then raise money for you to send you to. Yes. Because you're not obviously going to yeah. fund yourself. Right, right. Yep. Yep. British missionaries go to the British Empire? Yeah, and the, the, Carolyn just talked about the British Empire. That was a big part of it as well, the British missionaries going to the British Empire. And as, as the British Empire opened up, then British mission work opened up. There's all kinds of other challenges and conversations around that, around colonialism and missions and how that plays with 
each other and you're importing your own particular cultural version of Christianity and imposing that upon others and that has been a problem throughout the history of missions. Uh, been a lot of work to address that issue but that, that has continued to be a challenge is how we think about missions. But yes, Catherine. Two questions. Yep. One is going back to conversionism. Yeah. Um, specifically talking about the born again. Yeah. So last week you identified that the history of evangelicism went back much further than I had any idea. So has, has the born again concept always been a part of evangelicism? through history or was there a point in time yeah kind of in the rooting in the in the first great awakening yeah that that was and kind of you know John Wesley's own conversion story he talks about how he had this warm feeling come over him right when he was in a in a in a meeting in a prayer meeting and he had this kind of warm feeling that he felt a, a, a change a conversion within himself and then that really started to Think, uh, changed the way he thought about what faith was. So that born again conversionism has been part of the evangelical tradition going all the way back to the roots. Yeah. What I thought, but I just yep. And then I'm just curious, thinking about under activism, yep. or maybe I'm just more struck, particularly thinking about the social action. Yep. It strikes me thinking about as I think about my American view of evangelicism, yeah. particularly thinking back to the civil rights era, that, and I remember GW talking about this, uh, that many of the evangelicals failed yeah. in this area for some of the last to step up. Right. And so I'm, I'm curious, again, trying to understand the historical arc and not make American evangelicism right. it. the center of the universe right. as right. we in America are wont to do. Yeah. Um, is in your experience and your your historical research, do you see a marked difference in thinking about social action in American evangelicism as being markedly different? than social action in evangelicism and other parts of the world from a historical standpoint. Yeah, and I would say that, that um, so there's a, a, I think particularly talking about the civil rights movement and, and on, um, what, what tends, what everyone tends to think about when they think about evangelical movement is moral majority, Jerry Falwell from the 70s on, um, you look back behind that, and there is a deep tradition of social action within the, the evangelical world. Some of it was lost in the civil rights movement because of how racism has had made its way into the white evangelical church. And we're still dealing with that, as we all know. Uh, and that's still a problem that we have to, to, uh, to work through. Um, but prior to that, there are um, significant movements within identified evangelicalism of social action. Um, and I, I do think that's an important part of the conversation to help see that what most people think about since 1980 and the kind of you know deeply connected to one particular movement, that's not the totality of the evangelical tradition. Um, and there are resources that the evangelical tradition has that maybe we don't know or, or haven't been thinking a lot about because of this. I would say that you move to some of the progressive evangelical writers like Jim Wallace and Sojourners, he is tapping into some of those roots that go back. Further. Now, I think we have to do some thinking about how we do that and what that looks like, but that's there in the tradition. Certainly you see the history, particularly with schools and education, because yeah. the, the reality is the vast majority of, certainly just you look at colleges, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Almost every private institution yep. has its roots in some faith-based tradition, yep. by and large. Yeah, I mean, the, the Ivy League schools were all rooted in some form or fashion in 
evangelical theology. Even the callous. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Becky. Well, I was just going to say, in conjunction with that, that when you got to this slide, to me, I thought of Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And Roman much, Catholic Church is a long-standing yeah, social much action. Much more than the evangelical yep. church. Yep. And I feel like it might be not just moral majority, but even the neo-evangelicalism. Yeah. Like yeah. The whole Billy Graham thing, it became such a focus yeah. to save souls. Soul winning. Yeah. It's like we were no earthly good in, in a sense. Like, yeah. Yeah. we don't care what happens to you after <clears throat> that, but we just got to get you saved. It, was, yeah. Yeah. it became like this, to me, the overemphasis only on that and right. left this out. The born again language comes from Jesus Himself in the conversation with what Nicodemus. Yep, absolutely. So that's that's not a made up. It's not like piety. That word's not in the Bible. I don't think. But that, yeah, that's no, yeah. I, I, certainly, I think I don't think we want to jettison the idea of born again. Um, no, I, no. I, I think so. No, I, that, that, that what we're going to we're going to talk about next is is kind of how how conversionism has created some problems for us in the way we think about what it means to be the church. So that's kind of where we're going. So that's an excellent segue to what's next. Okay, so my question here is on the quadrilateral, what's missing? On the Bevington quadrilateral, defining historical evangelicalism. You're not really looking at your notes, are you, Dave? <laughs> what's missing? That's the problem with giving out the, uh, the notes ahead of time. But what's missing, in my view, I mean, it's not my view, it's, it's just not there is the church. So are you going to create the Lawrence Pentagon? There you go, there you go. That's what we're going for here. We need to bring this in. So what's missing is the church. The, the, and, and a, a robust ecclesiology, vision of the church, and what the church is, and what God is doing through the church. And as I said last week, and, and I said at the beginning tonight, in my view, this is the foundation of the problem that we find ourselves in today is that we are now starting to reap the problems that come without having uh, a deeply thought through theologically sound theology of the church. When I, when I say this, I want to say, obviously evangelicalism knows that there is such a thing as the church. And if you pick up evangelical theology books, there will be conversations about the church. So I'm not saying we've never thought of this before. I'm the first person who ever thought of the church. That's not what I'm getting at here. What I do think is in our locatedness right now, in the early 21st century, um, at the end of the era of Christendom, which in other contexts I've, I've talked a fair bit about that, Christendom was this time in which the church could assume, along with the state, having certain power in the culture to shape the culture. Uh, we don't have that anymore. And I think with that, with Christendom waning, then our lack of ecclesiology is exposed. And the challenges that come along with that are now being uh, brought to the fore. I believe that this thinking this through will lead us to some important insights into where we are and where we need to go. So let's kind of walk through why this is. Why has ecclesiology never had a central position in, in evangelical thought? Again, not saying it's never been thought of before, saying it hasn't been at the core. And you can see that in the Bevington Quadrilateral. Defining evangelicalism, you have the centrality of the cross. Amen. I am on board with that. The importance of the scripture, amen. I am on board with that. The need for conversion, amen. I am on board with that. The importance of activism, amen. I am on board with that. But the church as a central defining characteristic of evangelicalism is nowhere to be found in that. I think that's a problem. And as I said, I think we are, are now seeing the exposure of what that means for us. So what are the reasons why evangelicalism has never had a, a central 
uh, uh, focus on the doctrine of the church. I think the first thing is, in our history, we come out of a tradition that was rejecting the Catholic Church. And, there, and then the Anglican Church, with the Puritans coming out from England and, and, and disestablishing themselves from the established church, the state church in England, that our tradition has been a protest movement. That's right, Protestant. A protest movement against Roman Catholicism. And one of the key things within Roman Catholicism is the hierarchy of the church, the structure of the church, and all that comes with Roman Catholic ecclesiology. Central to what Luther did and what Protestantism has inherited and what we as Baptists have particularly inherited is the priesthood of all believers. And with that comes a rejection of priestly hierarchy of ecclesial hierarchy. Right? If you look at the um, organiz organizational structure of this church, guess what's at the top? It ain't senior pastor. And it's not even Jesus. If you look at what we have, it should be, but it's not. The congregation. Congregation, that's the top. Right? And then the board works for the congregation, and I work for the board and the staff, and that's our structure. The congregation is the top. We don't like priestly hierarchy. We rejected that. We protested against that. Dave. Um, what I learned growing up with Baptist distinctives, if you're Baptist, I don't know where it's supposed to rank, but I think I think it's always number one in every church is the autonomy of the The yeah, autonomy of the local church. body. Yep. And so there is no, you know, you can't tell the local church what to do. Yep. Yep. The local church gets to decide. You know? yep. So therefore, you know, that's why you've got so many different kinds of Baptists. Yep. Yep. Yes, that is uh, one of the fruits of that Baptist distinctive is lots of different denominations of Baptists. And then within those denominations, lots of disagreement about what it means to be part of that denomination. In fact, you know, converged. We're not a denomination officially. We are a fellowship of churches. It's very voluntary. Very voluntary. Right? And that's part of the Baptist distinctive. And it's a very Protestant, uh, evangelical way of, of being. It's kind of individualism at the local level, the local body level. So priesthood of all believers, rejection of hierarchy, stress on piety and individual conscience, which is sees very strongly in Anabaptist Pietist, Baptist traditions, free church traditions, um, these traditions very much centered on the individual and individual conscience and individual piety. Also comes with this an immediate relation of the human soul to God. Again, part of the protest of Protestantism is the rejection of the mediation of priests in the Roman Catholic tradition. In Roman Catholic tradition, how do you relate to God? Certainly you can you have your own personal prayer life, but primarily your life to God is via your priest. And how do you know you're in right relationship to God? Because the Pope is in right relationship to God, and the bishops who report to the Pope are in right relationship to God, and your priest who reports to that bishop is in right relationship to God, and therefore you are because you go through that process of priest to the bishop to the archbishops to the cardinals to the pope you know the whole the whole structural hierarchy of the roman catholic church and and so you don't have in the way that we think of it this kind of immediate unmediated relationship to god because you have the structures of the church that are the way that life with god is mediated and that certainly then means a rejection of that that the ecclesial institutions as well as sacramentalism because the whole structure of sacramentalism is all bound up in that mediation and hierarchy. How do you access grace in the, in the Roman Catholic Church? You access grace through the mediation of the sacraments. The grace of God is there. Catholic theology believes in the grace of God, but that grace is mediated through these different means of grace. Heard that phrase before? The means of grace. 
why do you go and take communion every week or every day as a Catholic? Because that's how you're receiving grace. You're receiving that grace through the sacramental meal, through the mass, through the seven sacraments that the Roman Catholic Church. So you have this hierarchy that mediates relationship with God, that mediates the grace of God. We don't have any of that, right? I mean, we take communion, but you all, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, if you're good Baptists, on the Sunday mornings when we take communion, um, you don't need that to be coming from me because I have some special power by which I mediate God's grace to you. We do that as a remembrance of the grace that we have, not as a means by which we receive God's grace. So there's a very different structure there that's based on how we think of the priestly ministration, the priestly work that we don't have in our tradition that Roman Catholicism and other liturgical traditions do have. Are you with me on that? And there's, again, there's a whole lot of other stuff we could go into there on on praying to the saints and Mary and the vault of grace that exists in heaven by which we receive it. And um, we, don't need to, we don't need to go into all of that. Um, but just to say that we don't think of the sacraments, we don't think of sacramentalism in the way that Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and even certain of like the Anglican Church, the High Anglican Church, there is a different than Roman Catholicism, but still a sense of mediation and the importance of the priest. I'm not all that important is really what it boils down to. Um, in Roman Catholicism, you need your priest. For you Baptists, you don't need me. Right? So, there you go. Um, second, then, is conversionism. Second reason why we don't have a strong emphasis on the church. Because what is the mission of the church? The Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How does that take place? Well, we come and we witness to people about who Jesus is, and we call them to personally accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We call them to be converted. This is rooted in the Reformation emphasis on justification. This is what I refer to as a transactional soteriology, right? That salvation is a transactional thing. For, for most of us, if we were raised in the evangelical church, we have some kind of an idea that's important that we can remember the moment of our salvation. That there was a moment that we can point back to and say, that's when I was saved. Because then we can have confidence that the transaction has taken place and I have been saved. That transactional salvation, you don't really have so much in Catholic tradition, Eastern Orthodox tradition, less conversionist traditions. You have that very much in the evangelical tradition. You don't have that so much even in more the mainline non-evangelical denomination something about our soteriology of the transaction that we, we need to have a moment in time where we can look back to and say, that's when I was saved. Now, I think that's problematic, personally. Um, but if we ever do a class on soteriology, we could talk that through. So with that then comes, once that transaction is complete, whatever comes afterward, it may be important but it's not essential. What is essential is con getting people converted. Because what is essential is getting people to salvation, to heaven. So once we have that transaction completed, then whatever follows after that, like I said, it might be important. We might talk about it as something that's important, but it's not essential. That's why there's no ecclesiology in the Bebbington Quadrilateral. Because the Bebbington Quadrilateral is primarily about soteriology, salvation, the work of Christ to do that. The Bible is the authority which leads us to that salvation, the conversion experience. And then activism has its place there, but that's, all, that's the living out of our own individual salvation, primarily that is in view. So the result of this then is that in, <clears throat> in my way of, of looking at this, I, I believe that the church is not essential to evangelical theology. The church is important. I hope we think it's important. But theologically, when you define evangelicalism, you don't have to have 
the church in that. Unless and only insofar as it's a collection of individuals who have been saved who then go out and themselves seek to convert others or do good things in the world. But a doctrine of the church as central to God's mission, as essential to what God is doing in his salvation work, is not what we see in the in the evangelical tradition. Cool. Yes? So you're saying that's the way it is, not yes. that's the way it should be? It's not the way it should be. Okay. That's, yeah. And, uh, as, over these next, story, next week and the week after, we'll unpack that a little bit more. But I do want, in just the few minutes we have left here, just to set the table for next week, all right? Um, and kind of position this conversation about the church and what, we, what we're missing because we don't have a uh, ecclesiology that's at the center of our faith. All right, so what is the impact of this on the evangelical crisis? I want to ask this by asking, where is the locus of God's action in the world? Where is God working in the world? What is the, the place where God is working in the world? And then I want to contrast liberalism and evangelicalism and then show you what's, what liberalism and evangelicalism both share. Okay? So if you ask liberal, I'm talking about theological liberalism here. If you ask theological liberal, where is God's action in the world? Where is the locus, that just means the place of God's action in the world? The theological liberal will say the locus of God's work in the world is in the renewal of social structures. In the renewal of social structures. Social structures are the problem. And therefore, we need to work to change the social structures so that they are more just, so that they are, uh, uh, that social structures are more fair and more equitable for all peoples. What is sin then in liberalism? Sin is primarily structural, not personal. Yeah, people need to change, but the way that we will change people is by changing the structures. It's by dealing with the, the societal structures. The reason that people act the way that they act is because they are in, inherently engaged in and formed by social structures. So if we change the social structures, then we will deal with the issue of sin <clears throat> in the world. How is Christ seen in liberalism? Christ is seen as a moral teacher who has given us ethical teaching that if we follow it, we will build a better world. So Christ has come to give us teaching about how to build a more just world, a more equitable world. Christianity in this view then becomes a, tributor, a contributor among others to the project of worldly progress. Progress is a very important word for theological liberalism. That we are making progress in our work to change the social structures. And that Jesus' teaching is influencing that. I think a, a, a danger, a challenge for theological liberalism is then transformation of the world becomes an end in itself. And ultimately, the problem with liberal theology, in my view, at its, at its heart, is that it does away with the person of Christ. The person of Christ is not necessary. What's necessary is the teaching of Christ. So once we have Jesus' teaching, say the Sermon on the Mount, now we can take that teaching, and the person of Jesus is actually no longer vitally necessary to the project of Christianity. We needed him to give us the teaching that he gave us. And his death on the cross is not a substitutionary death for sin. It's a, it's a moral example of being dedicated to the project of making the world a better place. So Jesus believed so deeply in his principles that he was willing to die for them. That's how the cross is viewed in theological liberalism. It's not a substitutionary atonement dealing with personal sin. Whoops. Dealing with personal sin. It's, it's, it's uh, an example. Jesus is a moral exemplar. And, his, and the cross is him demonstrating the utmost commitment that it will take to make the world a better place. So the structural sin is dealt with by 
getting the teaching that we need in order to deal with the structural sin. Does that make sense? So that eliminates the need for the resurrection as well? So the resurrection in, in much of liberal theology, I mentioned Friedrich Schleiermacher last week in our whirlwind tour as one of the, the uh, modernists that was influencing the, the, the church in the 20th century. Schleiermacher talks about the resurrection not as a literal, Jesus wasn't literally resurrected, but um, the, the resurrection is a symbol of the continual remembrance of Jesus' presence and Jesus' teaching. That it, it, you know, and you, you get this kind of thing in German liberal theology where you look back and you say, clearly people don't rise from the dead, right? The enlightenment science, we've learned these things. That was an ancient way uh, that was an ancient symbol that they may have believed something like that happened, but what we know now is that that didn't happen. But what it meant to them was that Jesus' presence or the remembrance of his presence keeps on in history and should keep inspiring us in history. But you don't have a vision of the resurre a personal resurrection of Jesus, bodily resurrection. Because, oh, sorry, Captain, just real quick. Because of your doctrine of sin. Right? That's, that's where this is, if you unpack a lot of this, the difference between liberalism and evangelicalism is going to be kind of around the doctrine of sin and how everything else plays out from that. So it just strikes me in viewing this then that it, in a, it would appear to me that uh, in the lens of liberalism, Jesus is not the Savior, he's not the Messiah. He is, okay, so this is where it gets very tricky li reading liberal theology, because they will use all of the words, but you have to kind of understand what the meaning of the words is. So someone like Schleiermacher would say Christ is Messiah in that he has come to bring the highest revelation of the teaching that we need in order to do the project of, of making the world a better place. But he is not the Messiah in the sense of sent by God to be uh, crucified as a atoning uh, work for, for the sin of the world through which we are reconciled to God. It's, there's, it's not that. So do they have a different view of the fall? Like yeah, yeah. They wouldn't have, there wouldn't be a, a literal view of the fall, certainly. It, it, again, it's symbolic that the, the world is not as it ought to be but not any kind of a fundamental, this is a fundamental problem with the human heart. Um, yeah. So, it's, this, it's very interesting reading liberal theology because all of the same words that we use are, you can find them there, but they often mean very different thing than what the Orthodox Christian faith throughout the history of the church has meant. Okay. So that's liberalism. Uh, oh, and then with that, then political power becomes essential to renewal, because how do you change the structures of the world? You change the structures of the world by having the power to change those structures. And so liberalism has a, a deep emphasis on political activism, political uh, uh, power in order to change the structures. Okay, so then evangelicalism, where's it? Yes. One of the reasons that I feel political power <coughs> becomes one is because the evangelicals have not taken on the responsibility of feeding the poor, taking care of the orphans and the widows, and those kind of things. We, we, we've, we've kind of... Yeah, so... We, 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 most of the evangelicals are more, in, more involved in um, prosperity evangelism. So can we, as they say, put a pin in that? <laughs> and we'll come back to that as we go down the line. Because I... I you know, obviously, this question of what's our relationship to the structures and to the powers. That's what Jesus came That's to. That's really important. Um, that's, my, that's my theology. One of the things that, you know, what I'm doing here on Wednesday nights, I don't know if you have caught this quite yet, but it's also paralleling with what I'm doing on Sunday mornings. Because what I'm doing on Sunday mornings is thinking about what was the presence of Jesus in relation to the world around him. And then how does that impact the way we should think of the church and our relationship? And in my view, at this point in time, I don't think that either liberalism or evangelicalism is steering us in the right direction. And I think we need to some other categories. So 
there are parallels happening between Sunday morning and Wednesday night, at least in my mind. I have no idea if that will come across to you all, but that's going on in my mind. All right, let's, uh, we only got about five minutes left or so. So evangelicalism, where is the locus of God's work? For evangelicalism, the locus of God's work is in the human soul, primarily in the human soul. Sin is personal and individual. And so what is God's work of salvation? It is the work of overcoming that personal and individual sin. So God's primary locus, his primary place of working is in the individual human soul. So therefore, the mission of Christianity is to save souls, to ensure that they will go to heaven. Um, political power, at least as we've seen it over the last few decades, political power is essential in this evangelical view, but it's essential to ensure a culture that is safe for our own personal piety. Why have we engaged in the culture wars in the evangelical world? Because we want to keep a culture that is safe for our own morality and our own cultural piety. Uh, and we're used to being able to call the shots on that. And so what we saw when we went through the history of evangelicalism, secular humanism, uh, Francis Schaeffer writing in the 70s, then Jerry Falwell saying, hey, wait a second, what Schaeffer is saying is that the secularity is taking over the American culture, we need to fight back against that. We need to keep America to be a Christian nation. And so that's where the rise of the moral majority and the Christian right really kicks in, is in that, that culture war, that battle to keep America, quote unquote, a Christian nation, that is essentially safe for us to raise our kids in, that is safe for us to have our own morality be accepted by others. Us and them. Us and them. And I would like to say, quite different than how Jesus declared our life in the world would be. Jesus didn't declare to us that we will go out in the world and it will be safe to be Christian. Were you going to say something, Dave? Well, also that we want the culture to, to be like us. And we want the culture to be like us. And yep. Not just that we want to be safe in the culture, we want them to be like us. And that inevitably then brings in power. And uh, how we wield the gospel, to what end, to what purpose. Um, and again, I think that's really a significant part of what the church needs to be thinking about in this point in time. I've been, again, if you pay attention at all to what I talk about, you probably picked up that that's something I, I tend to beat that drum a lot about what the church's relationship to power is, because I think that's vitally important to where we are. Yeah. I'm going to disagree with your previous screen and on the on liberalism. Well the first first okay. first uh, little thing. Yep. Sin is personal, individual. Can also sin be tribal or societal? Yeah, and I would say you're you're probably right to say that there there should be maybe an arrow here that goes to societal, that it it does yield that societal sin, but I, I would suggest that in the evangelical world, individual is is always the starting point of this, of the way that we think about salvation soteriology. So let me just finish up. We only got a couple minutes left. I'd be happy to chat a little bit afterwards. But I want to finish a couple things so we'll be in good shape for next week. All right, so then the danger, I think, I mean, to this point, I think what this does is it misses this. The social is vitally important in the Bible. The, 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 the social nature of being human is vitally important to the story of the scriptures. The Bible doesn't really think so much individually as it does societally. The individual is seen in light of the society. In the Western world, the society is seen in light of the individual. The Bible is much more Eastern than Western. And so I think we have some reckoning to do around how we read the scriptures, because we've been trained to read the scriptures individualistically. And the scriptures are rooted in a social category. Okay. Um, I think what these share is that neither has a vision of the church as essential to God's mission. Liberalism doesn't have a vision of the church as essential to God's mission. The church is a social activist club. Uh, evangelicalism doesn't have a church that is essential to God's mission because of our conversionist things that we've been talking about. All right, so my suggestion is that the locus of God's work in the world is the church. Liberalism says it's the social structures. Evangelicalism says it's the individual soul. I suggest it's the church. 
that's the locus of God's work in the world. So just a couple of things on this, uh, and then this will set us up for next week. God's mission is to build the church. I think God's mission is to build the church. It's a quote by a theologian named Stanley Hauerwas who says, the church doesn't have a mission, the church is the mission. The church doesn't have a mission, the church is the mission. We've lost our identity and our mission, rooted in a failure of ecclesiology. Because of that, we have gotten to the place where we have defined ourselves in light of political and social movements. And our mission then has been defined in terms of success in wielding cultural power. I would say that that is shared by both the right and the left, <coughs> and kind of defining our, our success. So let me just put before you here what this could look like in thinking ecclesiologically. And then we'll be done. Ecclesiology. Whoops. I don't know what just happened there. I just lost my... I guess so. I it, it <laughs> must time out right at 8, huh? There we go. Okay, so sin, biblically, is individual and social. Salvation is a creation of a new social reality. I believe what God is doing in the world is he is creating a new social reality. But that social reality is called the body of Christ in the scriptures. That God is, is creating the people of God, his possession. This goes back into the Old Testament with Israel all the way through to the New Testament. The body of Christ, that includes the need for individual conversion, but also stresses the conversion into a new social reality. We are converted from isolation into a new social reality, the church, the body of Christ. Fallen individuals are called out of that social relation of the old and into the social relations of the new. So the mission of God is to create a people for himself. The mission of the church is to be the church. That's our mission. The mission of the church is to be the church. The community that witnesses to God's rule through our ecclesial social life. Which doesn't mean we're inwardly turned and we don't have any engagement with the world around us. But it does shape the way we think about that engagement. And that's what we'll be talking about over these next few weeks. So that's where we're going. We need a new identity. We need to think through what it means to be the church. We need to think about what our mission is. This must shape our relation to the world and the culture if we were to witness to Christ. And so next week, we are going to be thinking about what the identity of the church is. So what we just talked about here at the end, that's where we're going to pick up next week and really unpack what that means for the church to be the church. Okay? All right. Um, it's 8, so we're going to call it a night. I'm happy to hang out, chat, uh, interact, whatever that looks like. Um, but uh, you're dismissed. See you next week. Thank you.